who's the rabbi here in Modesto at Congregation Beth Shalom, which is um, our local Jewish synagogue. Um, he's here today to um, do a presentation about some of his family uh, experience and some historical information about the Holocaust. I expect, and Mr. Mintir does as well, one, you are to be a polite audience. The rabbi has been gracious enough to give up the entire of, of his day to be here to talk to you. Okay? So, we should not see phones out, earbuds in, or hoods up. Okay? So you're going to hear a lot of information. There will be a time for questions at the end. We turned in questions. Remember we did uh, turned in questions. There were like 140 questions. And so Shalom's going to try to get to all of those, not all 140, but to some of the important ones today that kind of recurred, you know, that people had a lot of the same questions. So please give him your undivided attention um, and be a very respectful and polite audience. So far, everybody has been amazing today. We haven't had any issues. So, thank you. Thanks so much. Let me say up front, this is not easy information. It's not easy information for me to share, and I realize it's not easy information for many of you to hear. If you're wondering, then why are we doing it? Because sometimes what's not easy is what's most important. Today happens to be Holocaust Remembrance Day, and Hebrew we call the Holocaust Shoah, so it feels particularly timely uh, to be with you today. How many people would have recognized this picture without the caption? Couple? How many people think they would have recognized it before they read the Bible? Probably fewer. Very famous person, but here's the thing to keep in mind. Yes, she wrote a very famous book. It was never intended to be read by anyone other than herself. She wasn't an author, she was a little girl. And I believe that she'd be somewhat embarrassed to discover that her private words are the most read diary in the whole world, translated into many different languages. If the two of you could stop talking, that would really be appreciated, thank you. Another book that a lot of people encounter this information through is Night by Elie Wiesel, as he tells the story of him and his father being in a concentration camp. But here's the thing to understand. This is not just Anne Frank's story. It's not Elie Wiesel's story. It's the story of so many people, millions of people who suffered, who were murdered because of their identity. And in many cases, because their identity was Jewish. So let me explain a little bit about Anne Frank's family, my family, who exactly are the Jews. The Jews are the world's oldest monotheistic religion dates back about 4,000 years ago to the time of Abraham and Sarah. Very much the inspiration for Christianity and Islam. Jesus of Nazareth was a Jew. Muhammad was very much inspired by Jewish thinkers. And yet, despite these large religions that have grown out of Judaism, Judaism is a very tiny minority of the world. And whenever you're studying a story of persecution, it's almost always a large group of people versus a small group of people. Let's put some numbers to this. One third of the world is Christian. One fifth of the world is Muslim. One four hundredth of the world is Jewish. It's a completely different fraction of the pie. There are about 14 million Jews in the world today. There were 18 million Jews before the Second World War. This third point is confusing and that makes it important. Judaism is both a religion and an ethnicity. Someone can be culturally Jewish and not follow the religious beliefs of Judaism. Jews can be secular, agnostic, atheist. We're an extremely diverse people. But one thing that we are not is a race. Many scientists today say there's no such thing as race. It's a human construct. Some say, no, there is a thing called race. It's people that look alike. Jews don't all look alike. You cannot tell someone is Jewish by looking at them. Not all Jews have large noses. I'm very proud of mine. But some people have large noses and aren't Jewish. Not all Jews are white. Jews are originally from the Middle East, the land of Israel, Judea, also known as Palestine or Canaan. But today we live all over the world, speak dozens of languages. The Jews of Africa look African. The Jews of India, they've lived there for 26 centuries. They look Indian. The Jews of South America look South American. One thing the Nazis said, it's a total lie. Jews have Jewish blood. 
There's no such thing as Jewish blood. If you look at my blood under a magnifying glass, it doesn't have little stars of David. It's the same blood that you have. You know why? Big shock here. We're all related. We're one human species, one human family. As a religion, it's based on the 613 teachings of the Hebrew Bible, what Christians call the Old Testament. It's an extremely beautiful, detailed, meaningful faith, but that's not really my topic for today. But something to understand about Jewish culture, we have always honored literacy, education. We have a commitment as a people to making the world a better place, which means we've been accused of being overachievers. Not a bad thing to be accused of. Here's an example. We're 0.2% of the world, but 22% of Nobel Prize winners. Why? Because we're committed to working hard and making the world a better place. So what exactly is the Holocaust? And why would you care, particularly if you're not Jewish? The Holocaust was the systematic, deliberate murder of six million men, women, and children at the hands of the most culturally and scientifically advanced nation of its time 80 years ago. Let me unpack that a little bit. 80 years ago is the lifetime of your grandparents. It's not ancient history, it's fairly modern history. What do I mean by advanced society? Think about the United States. The world looks to us for fashion, for entertainment, for leadership. Well, that is what Germany was like in the 1930s. The world looked to them for leadership. And yet somehow this advanced society murdered millions of innocent people. Second point, very important. Yes, the setting of the Holocaust was the Second World War. But these people were not killed as soldiers. They were not enemy combatants. They were literally unarmed. They posed no risk to the Nazis whatsoever. So why were they murdered? Because they were Jews. See, the Nazis decided to blame the Jews for all of Germany's problems. They were scapegoated. They were othered. They were blamed for the problems of Germany. Now, why do we care? To study the Holocaust is to learn about humanity's darkest hours, hatred, fear, human-caused suffering. But it's also a story of bravery, of resistance, of compassion. Think about where in Anne Frank you see compassion, bravery, resistance. And this last line, maybe the most important on here, those who do not learn from history are destined to repeat it. You don't know how much I hope that the world has learned this history, and no one need repeat this. I refer to this as the pie graph of death. Who exactly was murdered? 13 million people were murdered. Innocent people. Let's explain who they were. 20% of them were Russian prisoners of war. The Nazis violated the rules of combat and didn't just capture prisoners. They murdered them. Millions of Russian soldiers. Political dissidents. More than a million people were murdered for simply disagreeing with Hitler and the Nazi ideology. If you protested the Nazis, you were sent to a concentration camp. You likely were murdered for standing up against this. 2% were Roma. Today some of you know them as gypsies. Murdered because they were Roma, because they were gypsies. Disabled. Think about that for a moment. Today in our society, if you are differently abled, we make accommodations for your learning, for your transportation, how you get around. The Nazi said, you're not fit to keep alive if you're disabled. And they murdered such people. This 1% that says other, that's mostly homosexuals. Gays and lesbians that the Nazis murdered because they loved people of the same gender. You, ethnic Poles, Ukrainians, Belarusians, Yugoslavians, simply killed because they were there. When the Nazis invaded these territories, they didn't just claim the land, they murdered the people that were on it and then claimed it as their own territory. The largest part of this horrible pie are the Jews of Europe. That's the blue section. Notice that very few of them were German Jews. That's really not where Jews lived in large numbers. 24% of this total were the Jews of Poland, home to 3 million Jews before the war, 90% of which were murdered, and the vast majority within a year and a half. Which brings me to need to talk about power. It's normal to be impressed by power. And let's face it, there's no question that Hitler and the Nazis were extremely powerful. Hitler was a charismatic leader. When he spoke, people listened. 
and he harnessed his country's frustrations, united the people, and began a battle for world domination. But power comes with responsibility. That's according to Voltaire, Winston Churchill, and Spider-Man's uncle. And Hitler greatly abused his power. You see, he promised to make Germans feel proud and healed. He boasted their Third Reich would rule the world for a thousand years. He promised that he would fix all of Germany's problems. He promised that all Germans would live in large homes with new cars and all the food they would want. But in the end, he left his own country in ruins. Millions of his own people died. An estimated 4.3 million German soldiers, dead. Half a million German civilians, dead. He turned people against their neighbors and friends. He broke all the promises. There were no mansions. There were no free cars. There was no food security. And in the end, he killed himself rather than take responsibility for his actions. That's not power. We call that being a coward. He unleashed an ancient hatred that still lingers to this day, a hate that we all have to stand on guard against. Now, I mentioned a couple times six million Jews. It's a huge number. It's hard to wrap our minds around. So I think this picture might help. How many is six million people? That's roughly the entire population of the Bay Area's nine counties. So the picture is San Francisco. In the background is Oakland. Not in the picture would be San Jose, Santa Rosa, all the suburbs around. So imagine everyone that you see in that picture and beyond killed within a year or two. Not because of war, not because of illness, disease, but because of othering, because of hatred. I know that's hard to understand, so put the number aside and let's talk about one kid. It's a very famous picture. When we see a scared child, why is he scared? That's clear to all of us. He's been taught what we've been taught. Police and soldiers are there to keep you safe. But these police and soldiers are pointing their guns at him. And they're making him leave. Now, where is he leaving from? That's not entirely clear. Maybe a home that he lived in with his family. Maybe a village his family lived in for a thousand years. Doesn't matter to the Nazis. You're a Jew. You're different. You have to leave. Where is he going? We know that. To a ghetto. An area to concentrate the people that the Nazis don't like. But here's the other question. What happened to him? We don't know. There's different people that have said, oh, that's me, or I knew that kid. We don't know for sure. But we know that it is very unlikely that he survived. The Jewish response to all of this history and information is two words. Never again. What you're looking at is a picture of the Holocaust Memorial in downtown Berlin. What do we mean never again? Never again for anybody. i got to say that's why I'm here right now. Not only because you read Anne Frank and your teacher invited me, but I'm well aware that we are living at a time and a place with increased hate and division. And it's very easy to say the words never again, but what does it mean? What does it mean when people feel threatened? I'm not just talking about Ukraine. I'm talking about right here in our country. What do we do that people don't feel safe, that feel division, that feel hatred? Now, what led to all of this? Othering. It might not be a word you've heard before, so let me use a British political cartoon to explain it. The guy is saying, we're a very tolerant society, but if you don't behave like us, you can go back where you came from. And you can substitute for the word behave, you don't look like us, you don't pray like us, you don't eat like us, you don't talk like us. In other words, this guy is telling those people, you don't have rights. I decide who belongs here. Othering is very simple. It's treating people like others. And this word web will show us other related words. Intolerance, bigotry, prejudice, discrimination, stereotype, racism, dehumanizing, disrespect. I would add to it Islamophobia, homophobia, sexism. Please answer these two questions in your own head. Thinking about it, not talking about it. Have you ever been othered? Have you ever been treated as less than you deserve? As someone said or implied, you're too tall, you're too short, you're too athletic, you're too smart, you're too poor, you're too rich, you're too female, you're too male, you're too white, you're too black, you're too Hispanic, you're too Muslim, you're too this. Second question is probably a little bit harder. You think you've ever othered someone else? 
You think you ever treated them like they weren't good enough, they weren't cool enough? It seems simple, but unfortunately it leads to hatred. Hatred can lead to murder. Murder can lead to mass murder. Which brings us back to her. To me, the power of Anne Frank and her story is that we can relate to her. She doesn't feel like other. She doesn't feel like history. Let me be clear, I've never been a prepubescent girl, but I understood every word that she wrote, and so does everyone in the room. We can relate to her. It feels like it would happen when she wrote this diary recently. That's true of all of these people. Ignore the fashions. Yes, they change. No one's wearing that clothing and suspenders to school today. But look at their faces. Who do they remind you of? Before the sadness and struggle of war ripped their lives apart, these kids had friends. They had interests. They played music. They played sports. They dreamed of their future just like we do. This kid did not say, I'm being persecuted, I'm being othered. No, he went to school. If he was like me, he probably ran late. And when he got there, he looked for his friends, and he laughed. He was a kid. They had winter break. They had summer break. They lived ordinary lives. They were all part of families. Some of them survived. Grew up and moved to Modesto. You're looking at Ursula Lowenbach Foster. Not only a childhood acquaintance of Anne Frank, but actually mentioned by Anne Frank by name in the diary. Perfectly sweet, perfectly boring. Why would Anne say that? Because they had a rivalry with the same boy. They both dated him at different times. She grew up to be a chess teacher, among other things. And she later, when she came to Modesto, told the story of how she survived by hiding in a three-foot crawl space for two years full of dirt and bugs and disease and other kinds of horribleness. Her brother before that was arrested, never saw him again. Murdered in a concentration camp, but lived and ultimately died here in Modesto. Maybe even visited the school. Here's another face to put with the story. This guy was born Miklos, which is a Hungarian name. He was born near the Austrian border in a town called Chaperon. You can see he later in his Mike or Michael when he moved to England, later the United States. He was a house painter. This picture really captures him, I think, in one picture. He was funny. He was warm. He was entertaining. He loved people. If he was here right now, you'd all be late for lunch because he'd walk up to each one of you. Tell me about yourself. What do you like to do? He liked to play soccer. He was a goalie. He loved interacting with people. One of his loves in life was talking to people. He put on funny costumes. He talked in funny voices. He entertained kids at birthday parties. And I knew him incredibly well because he was my stepfather. I met him before I was six years old, and he was a survivor. He passed away a couple years ago. He's not able to tell you his story. It's my honor, it's my privilege to tell you a little bit about it. This was the beautiful medieval city that he grew up in, and he would describe it as we were dirt poor, but there was love in the family, and that was all that mattered. With a younger sister, older brother, father and mother, got into lots of adventures, a fairly normal childhood, until, that's his neighborhood, until he was 10 years old, and the father died of disease. And in his words, the Hungarian government said, your father was Hungarian, you might have been born here, your mother was born in Austria, you have to go back there. Now keep in mind that back there was a place he had never lived before. And even though Austria was literally just a mile or two away, he was Hungarian, at least until the Hungarian government told him he wasn't. And so the family moves to Vienna capital city of Austria. It's a beautiful city. It's known for operas and beautiful architecture. That's not really their focus. They're just trying to survive. They have almost no money. It's a mother and three kids. And they rent a little tiny storefront apartment that I would say would go from here to that wall. There's one room that they lived in that they turned into an apartment. What's happening while the Sinai family is in Austria? Well, in January of 1933, Hitler was elected Chancellor of Germany. Two years later, the Nuremberg Laws, a Jew cannot be a citizen, Jew cannot vote, Jews cannot have a public office. And then in 1938, the Anschluss, the joining. Austria becomes part of Nazi Germany. All the laws of Germany now apply in Austria. What are these rules? The Nazis isolate and segregate Jews. Jews are barred from public school, universities, cinemas, theaters, sports facilities. In many cities, Jews are forbidden to enter, quote, Aryan zones. German decrees forced most Jews out of business, but that's just a buildup, because there's crystal matter. 
the night of broken glass, an organized attack against the Jews carried out by civilians and paramilitary forces in Germany and Austria, November 1938. The Nazi orders burned down every synagogue, that's a Jewish house of worship, in Germany and Austria, terrorized the Jews, make it clear they're not welcome here, smash the windows of all Jewish-owned shops. Those that resist or help the Jews, arrest them, send them to concentration camps, shot, shoot them on sight. These are actual pictures of synagogues being burned on Crystal Mount. And why it breaks my heart to say it, I'm going to, can you imagine that's your church? That's your mosque? That's your community center? What do you do? Can't ask the fire department and police for help. They're the ones who set the fire. And all across Germany and Austria, Jewish stores are being looted by the police, encouraging people to steal whatever is there. And if you were listening carefully, my stepfather's family is living in what looks like a storefront. And he would say to me, I remember this night every day of my life. All around is the sound of glass breaking. People are running, people are shouting, there are shots in the distance being fired. And I look up and a Nazi is looking inside the window. And he said he was a young guy, 17, 18 years old. Here's the key to this part of the story. He said, his heart wasn't in it. It's an interesting line. And they hear an older commanding voice say, smash the window. We have our orders. And the younger voice looks in the window and said, it doesn't look like a store. There's like a mother and some kids. It's not really a store. He says, you know what? Let's seal the doors so they can't go in and out. We move on. Let's move on to the next business. My stepfather said that Nazis saved our lives. What would have happened if we'd been thrown out into the street while people are being arrested and shot? He said there was good in that Nazi. He didn't want to do it. His heart wasn't in it. But this is what happened that night. Jewish homes, hospitals, schools destroyed. Rioters destroyed and burned 267 synagogues throughout Germany and Austria. 7,000 Jewish businesses damaged, destroyed. 30,000 Jews arrested sent to concentration camps. My stepfather's mother becomes desperate, appeals to the Red Cross, please save my family. And they respond, three tickets on what's called the kinder transport. We're going to put the kids on trains, take them out of harm's way. These are actual pictures of children being rescued by the Red Cross. You, the mother, have to stay behind. Your, your kids will be safe. They go down to the train station at the appointed day. The last minute, the younger sister starts crying. I don't want to go with my brothers. The mother says, the train's leaving. You'll stay here with me. My stepfather says, but what's going to happen? She says, it's fine. Who's going to hurt a young woman and a little kid? We'll keep in touch. We'll write. The war's going to be over soon. We'll see you soon. They say their goodbyes. They leave. And they do, they do write. In fact, they receive a letter that says the Nazis are forcing them to relocate to Poland. And then the letters stop coming. My stepfather and his older brother make it to England. He's raised in what you might describe as an orphanage. It's not a picnic, there's bombs falling, there's food shortages, but they're surviving. The older brother ultimately joins the army to fight against the Nazis. It's not months, it's years. The war is finally over. My stepfather starts a desperate search, what happened to his family? He eventually meets a distant cousin that says, Miklos, I'm really glad you found me. They're gone. They're murdered. The Nazis killed the entire family. I'm all that's left. My stepfather goes back to England, finds his older brother, who at this point has a family of his own. The older brother cannot handle this news. He shoots himself. He commits suicide. And my stepfather said, I made a choice that day. The same hope and faith that I would see my family would now have to be hope and faith that I would live a life of decency and dignity. And I would honor them through my life. And I got to tell you, I don't know how, but he pulled it off. He was one of the most optimistic, loving people I've ever met in my life, despite growing up without a family, despite growing up with such horribleness all over. Here's another face to put with the story. This guy's named David Bachner, my father's father. He's born in southern Poland, marries my grandmother, and they move to Berlin. And when people say, David, why are you moving to Berlin? He says, it's safer there. The Poles are not sophisticated. But the Germans are a cultured people and will be successful there. He opens up the tailor shop, he sells clothing, and moves the family into an apartment above the tailor shop. And that's where my father was born, in Berlin. 
my father said, I remember being about four years old and there was a big parade and I wanted to go outside. And my family said, you got to stay inside. Why? So there's, like, there's music and there's soldiers and it's fun. Well, the parade is Hitler and the Nazis parading down the main streets of Berlin a couple blocks away. And these smiling, waving flag people, that's a symbol of hatred. It's a symbol of other. It's not safe to be a four-year-old kid on the street if you're Jewish and the Nazis are parading through the street. My father remembers being four and a half, five, and coming into the house and seeing that the sign that hung over the business had something painted on it. Something like, don't shop here from the dirty Jews. Police had come and painted that. Think about that. The police are not arresting the people doing the graffiti. The police are the people doing the graffiti. My father said the family activity, scrubbing the paint off the sign and hanging it back up over the shop. My father didn't know was the next day, a couple days later, a German officer, a Nazi officer, came into the shop and said, Mr. Bachner, you're a good guy. I like the clothing. Take my advice. Get out. It's not safe here. Hitler's not just talking. Horrible things are going to happen for your people. Get out while you can. My father didn't know this. What he hears is his dad saying, we're taking a business trip. Come with me. As my dad described it, he walked out the front door with a little backpack, with a book, an apple, maybe a stuffed animal. Didn't even say goodbye. Didn't realize he wasn't going to be back for many, many years until he returned as an American soldier during the Korean War. They are not on a business trip. They go to Yugoslavia. Sorry, go back to that. Actual graffiti painted on Jewish shops. They go to Yugoslavia. Here's my grandfather. That's my dad. And when they're in Yugoslavia, they send money for my grandmother, my uncle, my aunt, to meet them in Zagreb in Yugoslavia. That's where my other aunt was born. And they appeal to a relative, actually a relative of a relative, living in Cleveland, Ohio. Get us visas. And right before the war began, they were able to legally enter into this country. Now, that's an important detail. Because once the war started, the United States closed its borders. No refugees. No Jews. That's a European problem. Stay there. We don't want to deal with it. So my family got in. Had they tried to come in just a couple months later, I probably wouldn't be alive. Because they wouldn't be alive. Because on the way out of Europe, they stopped by Poland. Because my grandfather had a brother with a large family there. And my father realized later we were there to say goodbye. We didn't know if we'd see them again. They didn't. The family that was left behind were murdered by the Nazis. I showed you a pie graph of hate. Well, this is the map of hate. There's thousands of little dots on it. And they represent the locations of a concentration camp a slave labor camp or a death camp, death factory. Let me explain the difference. Concentration camp is basically a prison. The Nazis concentrate the people they don't like in one location. Jews, gypsies, homosexuals, communists. But their ultimate game plan is not to take care of them in prison. They want these people dead. So they come up with a very ingenious idea. We'll create a slave labor camp attached to the concentration camp. We'll work the people like slaves. We don't have to pay them. We barely will even feed them. They'll contribute to the German war effort by working in our factories, and they'll die. Win-win. But the Nazis discover a problem with this sick plan. Two problems, in fact. Number one, people aren't dying fast enough. You see, somehow, being given almost no food, people are still clinging to life. They're holding on. Second problem, much more significant to the Nazis, the emotional cost of this. Now, you're thinking the emotional cost of the poor prisoners. No, the Nazis could care less about that. The emotional cost to them. It's a lot of work operating a slave labor camp. And at times needing to use a machine gun and kill down, mow down innocent people that you're looking at. The Nazis say, we need a method of killing these people that we don't have to see it. That can be done more efficiently. And they come up with this plan. It's a sick plan. But it's a detailed plan. This is the way the mass murder is going to happen. The Jews are told they're being relocated to the east. No one's told they're going to be murdered. That produces panic. That produces rebellion. You're simply being relocated. You in a suitcase need to be at a particular uh, train station at a particular date. And then tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people are forced into cattle cars. There's no chairs. There's no windows. There's no water. There's no toilets. And after days and days of being transported, 
they arrive, those that are still alive, to secret locations, not in Germany, but in Poland, known as Auschwitz-Birkenau, Belzec, Kremno, Majdanek, Sobibor, Treblinka. Upon arrival, their belongings, that last suitcase that they took, those things are sent back to Germany. The Germans can have the candlesticks and the clothing, whatever the people still have. Then their heads are shaved. Why? First of all, the Germans say, we'll spread less disease. But secondly, it dehumanizes them. People don't look like human with all their hair cut off. It's easier to murder people that don't look like you and me. But also, the hair has value. It's an industrial fiber. Why put it to waste? Their hair is literally turned into fabric. In Auschwitz, they're given tattoo numbers. In every concentration camp, they're given a number. They no longer have a name. They're just a number. To some extent, I would say they're treated much worse than animals. Animals are at least given a certain respect because we're going to eat them. These people were literally about to be mass murdered. Those that could work were used as slaves to run the extermination camp. Others contributed to the war effort. None of them were fed particularly well. Those that were deemed not worth keeping alive, older people, kids, sick people, sent to a building marked as showers. But no water comes out. Nazi guards drop in poison gas pellets. Jewish prisoners are then forced to burn the bodies, but first removing any valuables, including fillings from their teeth. And today, if you went to one of those dots on a map that was labeled Death Factory, you're likely to see something that looks like this. An empty field. Well, why is there nothing there? Where's the gas chambers? Where's the, where's the electrified fencing? Where's the uh, crematoria? You see, the answer is the Nazis knew that killing millions of innocent people was a war crime. They wanted to leave no trace, no proof of what they did. So after they were done killing people, they destroyed the buildings, they destroyed the crematoria. They plowed the land over, in some cases built other buildings there, and buried the ashes in the bones of the people they gassed and burned. And Frank's family, my family. But they miscalculated. Some death factories were left standing. And here's a picture they did not want you to see in a place called Auschwitz-Birkenau. And here's the story. At the end of 1944, the Nazis realized they're losing the war. And rather than stop what they're doing, they speed it up. There's still the Jews of Hungary that haven't been murdered yet. And they're murdering them tens of thousands a day. And they know when spring comes and the ice melts off the road, the Russians, the Allies will be there, and all this needs to be gone. That was the miscalculation. The Russians didn't wait. They mobilized in January of 1945. There are a couple kilometers from this site, and the Nazis panic. What do we do with all this evidence? They blow up as much as they can and realize, wait a second, look at all this evidence. The slaves that are working here, the people we're about to kill, what do we do with them? They march them back to Germany on foot in winter. Today, that's called a death march. There's very few people survive. They froze to death, they starved to death, they're shot at the side of the road. But the Allies arrive, and they find this location looking like this. It's a very interesting picture, by the way. This was taken by an American surveillance plane in 1944, proof the American army and probably all the Allies knew what was happening there. Bombs were never dropped on the train tracks or the crematoria. But the Allies arrive. And they find this location, including barbed electrified fencing, where people will tell you they threw themselves against it. They would rather die at their own hands than do the Nazi genocide. And one of the things the Allies found was this. This is a picture I took myself. And I have to say, when I was there, I was very confused. Why is there a park in the middle of hell? Well, here's the sign there. What happened in that clump of trees? Upon their arrival in Auschwitz-Birkenau, most Jews were sent by the Nazis for immediate death in the gas chambers. However, they were often forced to await their turn in this clump of trees the gas chambers were full. This was the overflow area. But notice this little caption here. Photo taken by the Nazis. The Nazis were not supposed to take pictures. This guy broke rank. He took this picture, along with a whole roll of film, and he sent it back to his family because he was proud of what he was doing. He was proud to take a picture of people a few moments before they were gassed to death. And when I look at this picture, I say, 
Did they know? Did they know they're about to die? I don't think they did. I mean, let's be clear, even if they're smelling the crematoria, do any of us know what human flesh smells like when it's burnt? I don't know that smell. Let's say they knew there was something wrong here. What could they do? They're unarmed. They're surrounded by Nazis with machine guns, German shepherds, electric fencing. I don't think they knew. But we know because their ashes are still there. Tons and tons of human ashes. And wherever these ashes are, these stones have been put up. This is in Hebrew, that's in English. To the memory of the men, women, and children who fell victim to the Nazi genocide, here lie their ashes. May their souls rest in peace. And I'm always asked, well, why didn't they fight back? The answer is they did. The Warsaw Ghetto, a couple of people with rifles held the Nazis with tanks and machine guns back for weeks. And even here at Auschwitz-Birkenau, in 1944, Jewish sold, uh, prisoners and Polish underground blew up one of the gas chambers. They knew they couldn't stop the Nazis, but they said, we can at least slow it down. We can slow down the killing. And as part of this, the Polish underground came in with a camera and took a roll of film. There's only two rolls of film of what happened at Auschwitz-Birkenau. Think about that. One taken by a proud Nazi. The other taken by a brave Polish underground fighter trying to show the world this is what happened. Ultimately, hundreds of people were captured as part of that rebellion and killed, but the evidence is left. These are the pictures the Nazis did not want you to see. The remains of gas chambers. The remaining evidence of a genocide that killed 13 million people, including Anne Frank's family and parts of my family. And then I had an experience that I realized my relatives did not have. I got to leave Birkenau. And when I left it, I traveled just a short distance away to the other part of the camp known as Auschwitz. You've probably heard the name Auschwitz. Why? Well, one, because of the horrible thing that happened there. But secondly, it's still standing. You can go. You can see it. The buildings are there. Today, it's a museum, the most visited location in all of Poland. The sign that the Nazis put up says, Arbit macht frei. Work makes you free. It's Nazi propaganda. Nothing made you free here. You're only going to leave here as a dead body. Primarily was a concentration camp. In fact, it was built before the war as Polish army barracks. The Nazis turned it into a concentration camp, a slave labor camp, and experimented with the first gas chamber. Could they master efficient genocide? What happened at Auschwitz-Birkenau? It was the largest Nazi concentration camp. More than 1.3 million people sent there, mostly Jews, but also Poles, Gypsies, Soviet prisoners, other ethnic groups. More than a million people died there. Approximately 90% of the victims were Jews, murdered by the Nazis in the gas chambers. It's a museum. You can see the actual pellets of the poisonous gas that we used. The company that makes this is still part of the German economy today. You can see a remaining gas chamber. You can walk inside it. The Nazis ran out of time to blow this one up. This was the first one built as an experiment. Could they produce an efficient way of murdering people? Part of the museum is a huge book. It takes up an entire room. It has the name of four million names of known Jews that perished in the Holocaust. I found my stepfather's mother, and the next column was my stepfather's sister. And then I turned to my last name. It's a strange feeling to see your wife's name, my name, Someone born in 1898. These are the family my father briefly visited in Poland. These are the people I would never meet because they were murdered. This sign grabbed my attention. In Hebrew, we call the Holocaust Shoah, complete destruction. The sign said, how did Jews cope during the Holocaust? During the Holocaust, the Jews found themselves utterly helpless, abandoned, and forsaken by most of the population among whom they lived. Condemned to death by the Nazis, they sought every possible way to survive and escape from them and their local collaborators. Clinging to life was the order of the day. Few rebelled, and most of those who did died in a hopeless struggle. Many tried to avert their fate by escaping, hiding, fighting in the forests. These efforts produced manifestations of human brotherhood, mutual aid, Jewish solidarity. Very few local citizens were ready to risk their lives to rescue Jews. Many of them that did 
has been recognized by Yad Vashem, the Israeli Holocaust Memorial, as righteous among the nations. Very few Jews survived. A couple of years ago, I had a chance to visit another dot on the map. This one known as Maidanek. It's right outside a large Polish city called Lublin. But the people of Lublin said, we didn't know it was happening there. Oh yeah, we saw lots of trucks arriving every day with people and no one ever leaving, but we didn't know. We didn't know that when the Allies arrived, there were thousands of people crammed into these barracks with lice and other disease, dying of starvation. We didn't know there were tens of thousands of pairs of shoes about to be shipped back to Germany, taken from the victims that were about to be murdered. And they also say they didn't know about this. Now, the top part was not there. That was built by the Russians. What's it underneath it? It's a mound of human ash and bone. Literally half a mile or so, even closer, to the city of Lublin. But they didn't know. They didn't know what was happening there. Well, at least that's what they said. I had a chance to visit my grandmother's hometown known as Tarnov. It's a beautiful little city. 40% Jewish before the war. This was left of the main synagogue that the Nazis burned down. But today there are no Jews in Tarnov. And I thought, what a strange feeling to walk where my grandmother walked. I'm sure you've walked in your grandparents' neighborhoods. And thought, my family lived here for a thousand years. None of them are left. And inevitably, the question I'm asked the most, can it happen again? Folks, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know. So I'll answer you with the words of Primo Levi, who was a survivor and an author. He wrote, it happened. Therefore, it can happen again. This is the core of what we have to say. Now, you've submitted to me some questions. Many of them I'll answer in writing with an email. Some I'll answer in just a couple seconds. But I have some questions for you. What do we learn from these stories? Just think about it. What does Anne Frank come to teach us? And how will you tell these stories when there are no more survivors? There are a handful left. They're in their late 80s. They're in their 90s. They're dying. You're the last generation to live when survivors from this Holocaust, from the Holocaust are alive. But they say a witness to a witness becomes a witness. So now you're a witness. How might you tell these stories? No one asked this question in this group, but I'm asked this all the time. Why do some people say they don't think it really happened? Or they say, well, it happened, but it was only a million people, as if somehow that would be okay. The answer is those who minimize or deny the Holocaust are part of the hate that caused it. It's a denial of Jewish persecution. It's a denial of suffering. It's a denial of history and proven facts. To deny it helps you avoid any responsibility from learning from it. See, Hitler did not create anti-Semitism. Some call it the world's oldest hatred. He didn't create it, he harnessed it. He used it for his own purposes. And the Holocaust didn't end it, it didn't vanish. It's morphed, it's persisted, it's still here. A survivor I had a chance to meet, another beautiful man no longer with us, he said, you know, there were just four kinds of people. There were the victims, the perpetrators, the people who did it, but then there were the bystanders. They, oh, they're not coming for me, I'm okay. I'm not affecting my family, I'll just mind my own business. But then there were a handful of what he called upstanders. And he looked to a group of people like this and he said, which would you have been? He said, I really hope you wouldn't have been a victim. I pray you wouldn't be a perpetrator, but would you be a bystander or would you be an upstander? And this is his question. How do we, how does the world move more people from being bystanders to being upstanders? I'm going to give you a chance to hear my stepfather in his own words. My message is never lose hope. Life is made of all these ingredients. Uh, uh, the guy who is executed, who wants to, is to be executed, hopes for a pardon. The thief hopes for a lesser sentence. You have to have hope and faith. With, two, with these two things, you can do a lot. You can do a lot. But you've got to be aware. You've got to do what's right. That's my message. Thank you very much, Mr. Sinai. Okay. I'm done. Hope, faith, 
But you got to be aware. You got to do what's right. You know, if you zoned out the last 40 minutes and you want to know what's the bottom line, one word, tolerance. Look around the room for a second. Notice how we all look a little bit different. I say, thank goodness we all look different. What a boring world this would be if we all were the same. What should be our response to all these differences in this room and in the world? Tolerance. Now, some of you want extra credit. You want to go beyond tolerance. I got an answer for you. Respect. Don't just tolerate the diversity. Embrace it. Respect it. Be educated. Be aware. But that's not enough. Take action when you see something is wrong. Someone is being bullied. Do you stand up or do you look away? Someone is threatened. Do you speak to a responsible adult or say, it's not my problem? What's your response when other people are facing othering and hatred and fear? So in the four minutes that we got left, I'm going to try to answer some of the questions that were submitted. Um, what was the, and the others I'll try to answer with an email. What was the craziest story you've heard? I've heard lots of stories, but one that feels pretty crazy is a person who survived many ghettos, many concentration camps, jumped off a moving cattle car heading to Auschwitz. He didn't know what it was, but he knew he didn't want to be there. Escaped the Nazis firing weapons at him, made it into the woods, met up with the partisans in the Polish underground, fought against the Nazis, blew up some kind of bridge or something like that, was captured by the Nazis, sent to Auschwitz, forced on a death march, survived, and had kids, and went on with his life. What have been your experiences with anti-Semitism in Modesto? I'd love to say none, but that's not the reality. Um, we've had hate flyers pasted in our building, and uh, every couple months we get a phone call or a weird letter in the mail saying, I hate you, you cause wars, you're the Antichrist, you're evil. And I think what goes through someone's mind that their to-do list for that day is threaten the Jewish community living in Modesto. I've never had it directed at myself. I've never met someone that said, I'm a neo-Nazi. But this is a current that's happening even here in Modesto. Are people judgmental about your religion still? The answer to this, unfortunately, is yes. We are living right now at one of the highest reported cases of hate crimes ever in our, in our nation. And the largest majority of those are directed at Jews and Jewish organizations. We're not the only ones targeted but we are one of the most targeted people in this country at this time. Um, how were you affected from your dad's past? What was it like growing up in a household knowing your family had been through the Holocaust? What's interesting about this question is I don't remember a time I didn't know about this. I do remember asking my stepfather when I met him, I was like five, five, six years old, why don't you have any parents? I mean, I felt like you know, my mom had parents and my dad had parents, why is this guy alone? Didn't really under understand um, the situation, but I do remember that my stepfather, first of all, woke up at four o'clock in the morning almost every day, immediately turned on the radio. And I'd say, why? You need to know what's going on. You need to be aware. I imagine if he was alive today, he wouldn't be sleeping. In terms of what's happening in the Ukraine, what's happening in our own country, I think he'd be completely obsessed with following this news. Um, he was a fun guy. He loved to laugh and joke, but I remember a couple times a documentary was on the TV while he was reading a magazine. And he'd look up and see like Hitler on the TV set and suddenly just start shouting at the screen, probably in Hungarian, but then you would switch to English, you blank, 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 you murdered my family. But then just went back to what he was doing. He kind of like would snap in and out of horribleness, but most of the time was lively and fun. Why do some people hate Jews? Boy, I wish I had an answer to that question because I try to change it. Um, ignorance. But I think that a lot of it is, it's truly maybe the world's oldest hatred. Jews were hated when we were the only monotheists. We've been hated by Christians and Muslims because we're not Christian or Muslim. Uh, we've been hated when we've been successful. We've been blamed for all kinds of things. Um, thank you. Is that your bell? I think it is. Thank you so much for listening. Really appreciate it.